And I talked in the previous lecture about that conversion to Christianity and how it came about, largely as a result of a, of a nighttime conversation Lewis had with friends in the grounds of Magdalen College, the college where he was a fellow. What I didn't say was, was, was more about these grounds in uh, Magdalen College. Lewis, Tolkien and Dyson walked around a riverside walk called Addison's Walk. Addison, Joseph Addison had been a, a fellow of Magdalen back in the 18th century. And the interesting thing is that Addison's Walk is a circular walk. It, it goes around the edge of a, of a water meadow, very beautiful place. And the evening was perfect. It was a, it was a warm, still evening in September. They dined well in the college hall, and they were walking around Addison's Walk, discussing metaphor and myth and Christianity, when their conversation, Lewis said, was suddenly interrupted by a rush of wind, which brought so many leaves pattering down that it sounded like rain. We all held our breath, appreciating the ecstasy of such a thing. Later, Lewis would, would say that he, he felt that this sudden rush of wind was, was like the breath of the Holy Spirit breathing into his life. And within a fortnight, he would be able to say, I have just passed on from believing in God to definitely believing in Christ. My long night talk with Dyson and Tolkien had a good deal to do with it. But what's this got to do with prayer? Well, an interesting facet of this event is the poetry that Lewis eventually made out of it. The significance of the circularity of Addison's walk was not lost on him. He wrote a poem about the walk, a poem that is now inscribed on a wall in the walk. It's a memorial that I was honored to have a part in bringing about, and it was unveiled in 1998, the centenary of Lewis's birth. The poem is entitled, What the Bird Said Early in the Year, and the call of the bird is understood to be a continual repetition of the phrase, this year, this year. I won't quote the whole poem, but it, it contains this promise. This year, this year, as all these flowers foretell, we shall escape the circle and undo the spell. What spell is this? I think Lewis means the spell of imprisonment within the circle of his own selfhood a sort of spiritual locked-in syndrome that had been alienating him from God. We escape this spell, we break out of this, of, of the circular walls of this prison, when we come to understand that Christ is the true dying and rising God. Christ has broken down the dividing wall between nature and supernature. Man and God have been united historically and permanently in the God-man Jesus of Nazareth. And it's God's Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy Trinity, who intercedes for us, and indeed for the whole of the groaning creation, loosing its tongue. I'm alluding here, to, of course, to St. Paul's epistle to the Romans. And that's not accidental. Lewis seriously began to read the epistle to the Romans on the advice of Tolkien and Dyson, in that very month, September 1931. Romans 8.26, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Escape from the circle of selfhood comes to C.S. Lewis as he learns, like Jesus, to be obedient to his heavenly Father as he accepts Jesus' bridging of the divide between sinless God and sinful man. And this escape comes to him in the act of imitating or repeating what it is that the Spirit says to him, the Spirit who prays for him and in him, and not just for him, but for the whole of the groaning creation, because God as Lewis elsewhere says, walks everywhere incognito. He plays in 10,000 places, to quote Jared Manley Hopkins. Birds and flowers and trees, like human beings, have all sprung from the same root, which is to say, the word coming forth from the Father. 
And that's why in the Addison's Walk poem, the promise of escape is uttered by a non-human creature, by the bird. The bird can speak God's word also because the bird has also been created and sustained by the word of God. For C.S. Lewis, a Christian is an articulation of God's word. And therefore, as the Christian prays, God speaks to God. It is by the Spirit that we cry, Abba, Father, as St. Paul writes in the New Testament. The task of prayer is to become the increasingly willing participant in that cycle, the divine cycle, not the circle of one's own selfhood, but God's word coming forth into creation, creating things, sustaining things, and then redeeming things by the Holy Spirit living in the life of Christians who, in, in response to the Spirit, offer their prayer and their worship back to the Father. We become the increasingly willing participant in that divine speech, not by means of psychological gymnastics, as Lewis puts it, though we've all probably done that as children, he adds, but by the union of wills, that is, our will and God's will, which, under grace, is reached by a life of sanctity. Prayer, then, for Lewis, only works as a part of the continuous act of God himself in which all finite causes operate. God's word comes forth, bringing all creation into being and then redeeming everything by speaking creation back to the Father as the Holy Spirit empowers Christians to pray and worship. We may tend to think that our prayers are just a one-way street, us speaking to God. But actually, they're also God speaking to us and in us and for us. And that's why in one of the Narnia Chronicles, the silver chair, you may recall, Aslan says to Jill, you would not have called to me unless I had been calling to you. The Christian's faithful response is made within the ring of faithfulness that God has cast round us. And it's that which, again, in the silver chair is beautifully symbolized at the end when the adventurers dig their way up through, through, uh, through the underworld and they come out into Narnia into a beautiful moonlit night and they find themselves in the very center of a dance, a circular dance, the, the great snow dance with snowballs flying back and forth out of the imprisonment of the underworld into this breathtakingly beautiful dance, what theologians call the, the perichoresis, the dancing about of the three persons of the Holy Trinity, 